The collapse and breakup of the Mongol Empire in the 1260s is usually thoroughly explained through the political tumult following the death of Great Khan Moncur in 1259. Dying while campaigning in China's Sichuan province, Moncur's death provided an opportunity for his brothers Kublai and Eric Bocker to fight for the throne, launching a series of civil wars which permanently ended Mongol unity. But what if we told you that Moncur's death was not the mere accidental result of a stray crossbow bolt, but an unforeseen consequence of a volcanic eruption that affected the whole of Eurasia? Today we will explain a brand new theory and highlight a little-known volcanic eruption of the mid-13th century, offering another insight on how climate and environment intertwine with human history and how it played a role in the collapse of history's largest contiguous land empire. Shout out to Conqueror's Blade for sponsoring this video. Conqueror's Blade is a free-to-play tactical MMO action strategy game on PC set in a medieval world, giving players a chance to create a warlord from 11 weapon classes, command an army recruited among 80 diverse units, fight in 15 vs 15 PvP battles, and build their empire. Conqueror's Blade's free Season 6 called The Scourge of Winter will be live from December 16th, and North American players will now be able to battle on the dedicated Cloudwing Valley and Eagle Range servers. A powerful horde of bandits led by a man calling himself the Scourge of Winter ravages the North and it's your mission to stop him. Use three new mighty units, Lansconnects, Armager Lancers and Liao's Rangers, and ride through a new climate, harsh weather, against the Scourge of Winter. Buy a new season pass and unlock rewards like the Arc Nemesis Hero Attire, 11 Weapon Skins, new versions of Classic Armor and the Desecrator Hero Attire. Support our channel and start playing this awesome game by clicking the link in the description. An exclusive offer for our subscribers, register through the link and get a free 7-day premium account. For decades, historians have not shied away from investigating the role climate and environment played on the Mongol Empire. A well-known article by Neil Pedersen et al. utilized tree ring data to demonstrate that a prolonged drought in late 12th century Mongolia was followed by an exceptionally warm and wet period in the early 13th century. A dry and cold late 12th century, stressing resources and starving animals, likely contributed to the constant fighting which saw the warlord Temujin eventually overcome his rivals. After uniting Mongolia in 1206 and taking the title of Chinggis Khan, a 15-year period between 1211 and 1225 of consistently warm and wet weather in Mongolia unlike any other in the last 1,000 years followed. To the newly unified tribes, it seemed heaven expressed its support for Chinggis Khan by providing perfect conditions for more productive grassland, a boon to the Mongols' herds which in turn supported the early conquests. Other studies, such as a well-known article by Ulf Bündgen and Nikola de Cosmo, have argued that wet conditions in Hungary in early 1242 forced the Mongol withdrawal there, though it has not found widespread acceptance among scholars. But climate has always taken a back seat when it comes to discussing the breakup of the Mongol Empire into independent Khanates in the 1260s. Mongkar Khan's death while campaigning against Song dynasty fortresses in Sichuan prompted a race to the throne by his brothers, sparking a conflict which permanently ended Chinggisid unity. For most scholars, this explanation has been perfectly sufficient. Yet a new theory offered by Zolt Pinker, Stefan Pau and Zoltan Kern offers an entirely overlooked contributing factor which was exacerbated by these political developments. For this, we must leave the Sichuan Basin and look to the island of Lombok of modern Indonesia. On Lombok, likely in late 1257, the volcano of Samalas underwent a massive eruption, leaving only an 8 km wide caldera behind. Learned about only comparatively recently by the scientific community, the eruption was one of the largest of the last 10,000 years and ranks a magnitude 7 on the Volcanic Explosivity Index. In comparison, the famous eruptions of Vesuvius and Mount St. Helens registered as a 5. 
no other volcano sent as much volcanic sulfur into the stratosphere within the last 7,000 years, an amount greater than even the more famous eruptions of Tambora or Krakatoa. Though sometime in late 1257 remains the most commonly cited date, arguments for earlier in the 1250s have also been put forward by scholars like Martin Bauck. Massive volcanic eruptions can have dramatic effects on the global climate, particularly for volcanoes close to the equator, such as Lombok. By spreading sulfur-rich gases throughout the atmosphere, the eruption reduced incoming solar radiation, which in turn reduced the global surface temperature. The result was intense and unusual weather recorded around the world. First on the island of Lombok itself comes the Babad Lombok, written on palm leaves in Old Javanese, which records the eruption of Samalas. The catastrophic eruption tore down the volcano, wiping away the capital city of Pamitan and forcing evacuations of numerous villages and untold deaths. In Japan, unusually wet years and possible volcanic dust veils followed, causing widespread crop failures culminating in the Shoga famine, causing civil discontent and banditry. In Korea, crop failures compounded the disaster from the prolonged conflict with the Mongols. The long-resisting military government finally collapsed in 1258 as starvation undermined what little remained of its support. In China, 1258 was recorded as exceptionally dry, causing crop failures and famine. The Song Emperor issued several edicts to heaven for rain, and when it finally came in 1259, it came in intense amounts that caused flooding and spread disease. In the Rus principalities, frost was reported until the start of the summer in 1259, and famine affected both farmers and their livestock. In the Caucasus, extreme cold and starvation were there too recorded, as well as summer snowfalls. Considerable charter and chronicle material supported by tree ring data builds an image of widespread ecological issues across Europe. It seems already over the 1250s, food issues and poor harvests had been consistent, but the eruption aggravated an ongoing crisis. Descriptions of famine, epidemic and flooding spike dramatically in 1258. The winter of 1257-8 was exceptionally wet and cold. In France, the spring of 1258 was excessively cold and resulted in bread, meat and wine shortages. England too reported uninterrupted heavy rain over the winter, and the city of London was forced to import grain from Germany. In the Holy Roman Empire, the rains led to flooding which washed away bridges and villages. In northern Italy, the most detailed data is recorded in the sufferings of individual cities. Riots over the multi-year-long crisis in Perugia sparked the well-known flagellant movement in 1259. Sweeping across Europe, people punished themselves to seek God's forgiveness for the crisis. With disasters reported along the fringes of the Eurasian continent, it begs the question, what was the effect on the area between them? At that time, almost all of this area was under the rule of the Mongol Empire. Only three years after the eruption of Samalas, this same empire broke into independent Khanates. But possible mentions of ecological disaster have been previously overlooked. The new massive rounds of imperial expansion in the late 1250s and ensuing civil wars proved a great distraction to the contemporary authors within the empire. Food shortages can be as easily ascribed to thousands of Mongols and their horses trampling over farmland as they can sudden weather shifts. But here is where Powell, Pinker and Kern make their contribution to the scholarship by identifying conditions worsened by the eruption, which affected Monka's fate and the course of the fighting in the Tollywood Civil War. In 1258, Great Khan Monka launched a massive, multi-pronged assault on the Song dynasty. Monka personally led the force into Sichuan, where after initial success, found his advance ground to a halt at the fortress of Jiao Yucheng. Here, 20 days of heavy rainfall made military operations untenable, howling winds throwing siege ladders to the ground. Frustration set in as a disease outbreak spread among Monka's troops. 
the heavy rainfall and immobile troops left little access to clean water. Monka is specifically described in Chinese and Persian sources as drinking wine to avoid taking in any contaminated water. The situation grew tense. One of Monka's lead generals, a Chinese man named Wang Decheng, was killed in an assault on the fortress. Finally, on the 11th of August 1259, Monka himself succumbed, either to the disease spreading among the troops, or in some later Chinese accounts, by a projectile lobbed by the defenders. With Monka's death, his brothers Kublai and Arik Boka both attempted to claim the vacant throne themselves, leading to the civil war which ended Mongol imperial unity. Now you may be wondering, where does the volcano fit into this? The continuous rainfall seems an obvious answer, but heavy rain in the Sichuan Basin in the summer is not unusual. No, rather the culprit is more microscopic, the disease which claimed Monke, very likely cholera. To explain this rather unusual relationship, we need to use some more modern examples. The Tambora eruption of 1215, the Kosuina eruption of 1235, and the Pinatubo eruption of 1991 all preceded cholera outbreaks in Bengal in 1817, 1837, and 1992. Pinker, Pau, and Kern have identified these eruptions as possibly ideal conditions for a cholera outbreak. As described earlier, eruptions eject large amounts of sulfur-rich gases and particulates into Earth's atmosphere, reducing incoming solar radiation and reducing the global mean temperature. Researchers like Datweiler et al. have demonstrated that such events can affect the planet's dominant means of climate variability over the tropical Pacific, the El Niño Southern Oscillation, or ENSO. Essentially, it creates the likelihood for a stronger El Niño event, raising the surface temperature of the ocean, especially in the Bay of Bengal, and disturbing the Asian monsoon season. It is the opinion of Pinker, Pau, and Kern that Samalas in 1257 did just this, which through affecting the monsoons would have accounted for droughts experienced in 1258, followed by excessive rainfall in 1259. Through this El Nino event, they hypothesize, the warming waters in the Bay of Bengal became ideal conditions for a phytoplankton and zooplankton bloom, and carried among these copepods are various strands of the cholerae, the organism which causes cholera in humans. The theory goes that this plankton bloom in the Bay of Bengal, upon reaching the densely populated Ganges Delta, caused an above-average incidence of cholera in the local population, as seen in the 1817 epidemic. Contemporary Indian sources do not describe a pandemic at this time, but sources from the Delhi Sultanate only tend to mention diseases if they affected the ruler or princes. The theory by Pinker, Pau, and Kern suggests that this emerging epidemic spread from Bengal through the trade routes into Yunnan, where Mongol armies were preparing to strike out at the Song dynasty. The 1817 pandemic, for instance, reached China quicker through these Southeast Asian overland routes, faster than it came to China's port cities by sea. Both Yuan and Song dynasty sources refer to a significant epidemic striking China over 1259 and 60. Early in 1259, Monka even held a Kiriltai to decide on whether they should progress into these conditions. Monka decided on campaigning anyways, only for his army to become stuck in mud and sieges in Sichuan, where this epidemic spread among his men. It seems Uriankadai's army, operating in southern China, and Kublai's army, besieging what is now modern-day Wuhan, all suffered a bout of this disease, though the evidence is less clear. While the popular image persists of medieval peoples not understanding how disease spread, both Chinese and Persian sources have Monka drink wine in order to avoid the water, evidently noting how men forced to drink the tainted water grew violently ill and died. However, Monka's efforts were in vain, and as described in the history of Rashid al-Din, he caught the illness spreading amongst the men. The description given by Rashid al-Din matches the symptoms of cholera. For the later Chinese accounts of Monker being killed by a projectile from the defenders, 
It is likely that this was a conflation with the fate of Monka's commander, Wang De Zhang, who was killed by them. Remembering that they killed a prominent commander, and remembering that the Khan died soon after, it is not a far distance for the two events to become merged into one in later local memory. Monka's death, likely of cholera, was an indirect consequence of the eruption of Samolus, and it had immense consequences on the Mongol Empire. With no designated successor, two of his brothers, Kublai and Arik Bakr, now raced for the open throne. Arik based himself at the imperial capital of Karakoram in Mongolia, while Kublai situated himself in North China. Wielding the resources of Northern China, Kublai of course had a significant advantage, and indeed denied Arik access to valuable grain shipments to feed Karakoram. Furthermore, primary sources like Rashid al-Din, supported by tree ring data, describe a drought and harsh winter plaguing Arik's forces. From Mongolia, the Yenisei River Valley to Amalik, hunger stalked the steppes in the early 1260s. Arik's men and horses withered and died, his followers abandoning him until he surrendered to Kublai in 1264. Samalas's impact on the Eurasian weather patterns may have induced severe drought upon Mongolia, and when coupled with Kublai denying Arik Bukha access to Chinese resources, ensured starvation among Arik's followers and herds, ensuring Kublai's eventual victory as Khan. By the time of Arik's surrender, Kublai was now Khan of only a quarter of the empire, his war with Arik providing time for their cousins in the west to carve out their own empires. The Samalas eruption did not directly annihilate the Mongol Empire, rather it affected climactic conditions around the world which compounded tensions long building within the Mongol Empire. The volcano's impact on the Asian climate simply opened a window for these tensions to bubble violently to the surface. Samalas may have influenced weather systems which resulted in droughts, heavy rainfall, or ideal scenarios for the spread of cholera. But Samalas was not responsible for Monka's choice to not appoint a successor, nor his decision to attack the Song dynasty. It provided conditions beneficial to Kublai to stake his claim for the Khanate, but Samalas did not make him go to war with his brother. Such is the relationship between humanity and climate. Climate and environment may encourage human decisions or stress societal relationships, but it is still upon humans to act on it. In the case of the Mongol Empire, the Samalus eruption may have indirectly influenced the specific method of its dissolution in 1260. Such is the argument provided by these researchers. We will continue to explore Mongol history in future videos, so make sure you've subscribed and have pressed the bell button. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.